Rocket Lab just wrapped up qualification testing for neutrons fairing. Big milestone. The Archimedes engine fired successfully 164,000 pounds of thrust. On paper, everything looks great. But talk to aerospace engineers off the record and you'll hear a different story. They're watching this with a mix of admiration and concern. Here's what keeps them up at night. Neutron is rolling three completely untested technologies into one rocket. Brand new methane engine. Never been done before fairing design. First flight reusability. SpaceX took a decade to get Merlin reliable. Blue Origin's been wrestling with BE-4 for over 10 years, and it's still giving them trouble. So the question everyone's asking quietly, is Rocket Lab about to pull off something incredible? Or are they setting themselves up for years of painful lessons? <clears throat> Let me be clear about something first. What Rocket Lab's accomplished so far is genuinely impressive. The Archimedes engine isn't some incremental upgrade. It's a full-flow staged combustion methane engine, same class as Raptor and BE-4. Test firings looked good, solid thrust numbers, efficiency where it needs to be. The hungry hippo fairing passed its tests, opening and closing in 1.5 seconds. Hardware's moving to the launch pad. By every traditional metric, neutrons on track. But that's where things get complicated. Because Archimedes has never actually flown. Zero flight hours. And Rocket Lab's planning to bet everything on it working perfectly while also testing a radical new fairing design and attempting to land the booster. All on Flight 1. Look at what happened with Falcon 9. SpaceX had a huge advantage. Merlin engines already had dozens of flights on Falcon 1 before they ever put them on Falcon 9. Even with all that flight heritage, they still lost engines. CRS-1 in 2012, engine failed mid-flight. SpaceX survived because they'd built in redundancy and had years of data to work with. Rocket Lab doesn't have that cushion. They're going straight from test stand to orbital mission. Now the hungry hippo fairing I'll admit, it's clever. Traditional fairings get jettisoned because keeping them costs you performance. Every kilogram of structure you keep is a kilogram you can't use for payload. SpaceX throws their fairings away. Well, they recover them now, but still separate them because the math works out better that way. Rocket Lab's betting they can flip that equation. Maybe they can, but we won't know until it flies. Think about what this fairing has to do. It has to handle max Q, that's 275,000 pounds of aerodynamic force trying to rip it apart. Then it operates in vacuum, extreme temperature swings, opens up to deploy the payload, closes again, and becomes part of the landing vehicle. Those canards they tested to 125% load, sure, they pass static tests. But static testing doesn't tell you what happens when you've got plasma streaming around them during re-entry, and the flight computer's making thousands of tiny adjustments per second. Which brings us to landing. Rocket Lab caught an electron with a helicopter once. Spectacular footage, really impressive engineering, but that's completely different from what Neutron needs to do. Propulsive landing is brutal. You're coming back from orbital velocity managing extreme heating, structural loads, aerodynamic control, engine throttling, all while your software juggles thousands of variables in real time. SpaceX made it look easy eventually, but watch their early attempts. Boosters exploding, tipping over, slamming into the drone ship. It took them 20 missions to get consistent, and they could afford those failures because landing was a secondary objective. The primary mission, Delivering payload, that kept going. Will Rocket Lab's customers be okay with that level of risk? I'm not sure insurance companies will be. <sighs> Here's the part that really worries me. In aerospace, there's this principle everyone learns. 
Change one thing at a time. New engine? Use a proven airframe. New landing system? Use a proven engine. That way, when something breaks, and it always does, you know where to look. Rocket Lab's throwing that rule out completely. If Neutron's first flight goes wrong, how do you even diagnose it? Was it the engine, the fairing, the landing software? When you stack unknowns on unknowns, troubleshooting becomes exponentially harder. Look at what happened to Blue Origin with BE-4. That engine was supposed to fly in 2019. It's 2025. Vulcan's flown twice. What took so long? Turbo pump problems, combustion instability, manufacturing issues. And that's with Jeff Bezos writing blank checks. Blue Origin had unlimited resources, unlimited time to iterate, singular focus on getting one engine right. Still took over a decade. Rocket Lab doesn't have that luxury. They're publicly traded. Shareholders expect results. The market's not going to wait around while they spend years debugging. And the market timing's brutal. By 2026, when Neutron's supposed to fly, Starship might be operational. If SpaceX gets even close to their target pricing with Starship, the whole medium lift market could just vanish. So Rocket Lab's stuck. Move fast and accept massive technical risk, or slow down and maybe miss their window entirely. There's no good answer there. Then there's the customer confidence problem. Rocket Lab built a great reputation with Electron. 70 successful launches, solid execution, customers trust them. But Neutron's a completely different beast. Satellite operators are conservative, government agencies even more so. They need proven reliability before they'll put expensive payloads on a new rocket. Early Neutron flights will carry test payloads, cheap stuff. The real money won't come until they've proven the design works consistently. And if those early flights have problems, insurance rates stay high, customers stay cautious, and suddenly your $55 million launch costs more than Falcon 9 once you factor in premiums. Market perception lags reality by years sometimes. Even ULA struggled with Vulcan, and they've got decades of experience and a nearly perfect track record. Vulcan uses the proven Centaur upper stage, relatively conventional design, still took way longer than planned, and it's still dependent on BE-4 engines that have been problematic. If ULA with all their resources and institutional knowledge struggles, what does that mean for Rocket Lab trying to innovate on three fronts simultaneously? I'm not saying Rocket Lab's going to fail. They've surprised people before, Going from startup to America's second most active launch provider took serious engineering talent and execution. But this is different. This isn't scaling up Electron. This is stepping into completely new territory on every major system at once. The next year is going to tell us a lot. Neutron's first flight will answer some questions, raise plenty of others. Nothing ever performs exactly like the models predict. There will be surprises good and bad. What matters is how Rocket Lab handles them, how fast they can iterate, how well they can fix problems, how they manage customer expectations through the learning process. That's what separates success from expensive lessons. The aerospace industry has seen bold bets before. Some pay off spectacularly, most don't. We're about to find out which category Neutron falls into. So here's where we are. Rocket Lab's making a massive technical bet. Three unproven technologies launching together. History's not on their side with this approach. But if they pull it off, it'll be one of the gutsiest moves in commercial spaceflight. Next year's going to be fascinating either way. I'm curious what you think. Is this brilliant or reckless? Let me know in the comments. And if this kind of analysis is useful, hit like and subscribe to New Space Review. We dig into these stories deeper than most. Before you go, check out the video on screen about how SpaceX is planning to move Starship across the ocean. Marmac 31 is a game changer for their whole operation. Really interesting logistics story that connects to what we talked about today. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one. On January 1st, SpaceX VP Kiko Donchev 
revealed the answer to a billion-dollar question. How do you move a 230-foot rocket across the ocean? The Marmac 31 barge just completed its first trial run. But the real game-changer isn't the ship. It's the cargo. Instead of transporting new boosters, SpaceX might send Booster 12, a vehicle that already flew and was caught in Texas, to launch again from Florida. This isn't rocket reuse anymore. This is rocket redistribution. But can hardware that survived re-entry survive a sea voyage? December 30th, 2025. Most people were still celebrating the holidays, but Julia Bergeron was doing what she does best, watching Starbase like a hawk. She spotted a massive barge at the Turn Basin, delivering hardware to Bale Brothers Canal Lot. Something felt different about this one. She tagged Kiko Donchev on X. Did SpaceX just deliver a Starship transport barge? His response came within hours. Good eye, still needs a little work before we put the name on it, but it was a good first trial run of a transport. That confirmation changed everything. SpaceX's vice president of launch doesn't usually comment on random barge deliveries unless something big is happening. And this was big. The vessel is Marmac 31, 260 feet long, 72 feet wide, typically used for offshore construction. Nothing special on its own. What makes this interesting is what SpaceX did to it. They added reinforced skirts designed to cradle cylindrical rocket sections during ocean transit. That meant engineers had to calculate load distribution for a 200-ton booster lying horizontal on a moving deck. Ocean swells, wave impacts, constant motion, every grid fin actuator, every raptor connection, every weld has to handle conditions it was never built for. Now, shipping rocket stages by water isn't exactly new. NASA did it during Apollo with Saturn V stages. The shuttle external tank traveled on the Pegasus barge from Louisiana to Kennedy. ULA still ships Atlas and Delta components to the coast today. But those were all one-way trips with brand new hardware heading to launch sites. What SpaceX is attempting with Booster 12 